So I'm Nick Patch, and I'm here today from Brooklyn. I, I work on the international team at Shutterstock, where we localize, we internationalize and localize our various web applications and services, I, and work with localized formats, languages, um, and currencies, content, and through that, I work a lot with Unicode. So I've given some talks in the past on fundamental Unicode, sort of zero to Unicode talks, and that's not what this is, but hopefully there's a little something for everyone because I wanted to give tips on ways that you can, either the best way to do things in Unicode or just ways to take advantage of the powers of parsing data with Unicode. Um, the name Unicode Best Practices here I came up with because there's a popular book called Perl Best Practices, but, and it has lots of very good practices in it, but absolutely none to do with Unicode or UTF-8. I, now, I wanted to fill in the holes with that. This specific version is not a Perl-specific one. This is uh, aimed at being language agnostic. Um, hopefully everyone can get something out of it. And, you know, best practices, that's sort of a loaded term. I can't claim to have all the best practices, but I can claim to have some that have worked well for me. I, and I've worked with this a lot, so first off, generally we're working with UTF-8 encoded content. I, UTF-8 is the most common character encoding on the internet. And when we're do use, doing data interchange, it's generally with UTF-8. For many protocols and standards, it is the default encoding. So, say we've got some uh, UTF-8 encoded content and we actually want to do some programming with uh, our strings. You receive the UTF-8 encoded content, you decode it, then you've got character strings that you work with, hack, hack, hack on them, encode them at the end of your application or script, and you have UTF-8 encoded output. With most programming languages, this is the uh, flow. So with um, Perl or Python or Ruby, this is the flow you'll have where you have encoded content on your input, and then you have some sort of either UTF-8 encoded data or byte strings. You want to get that to be a character string so you can properly work on the character level instead of the byte level and then do all of your programming on the character strings. There's some exceptions with programming languages such as PHP, where all of your strings are uh, encoded content and on the function level, you sp explicitly state that you're using UTF-8, uh, but in a lot of other popular languages, it actually has the idea of a character string as a base data type. So another thing I recommend is having UTF-8 so encoded source code. I, with many languages, you can have the option of having different uh, encodings for your source code. So for example, even with Perl, traditionally it was Latin 1 by default, I, and I recommend using UTF-8 instead. I, in general, if you just have UTF-8 for every single file, whether you have things that are non-ASCII or not, Relying on UTF-8 uh, source code across the board will save a lot of pain. And I have created a, a GitHub repository with examples in many of the languages, uh, many popular languages for the examples that I'll show here. I, at the end, I'll post it. It's, uh, I, I'm Patch on GitHub, and the repository name is uh, Unicode-cookbook, but I'll post that later. So, and as I mentioned, UTF-8 for the I.O., there are plenty of reasons to use other encodings, but unless you have a reason to do that, just use UTF-8 by default. So in Perl 5, for example, you would say use UTF-8. The UTF-8 pragma uh, specifies my source code is in UTF-8. I and Last week, or about a week ago, I was at YAPSI, the Perl conference, giving a Perl-specific version of this talk. And somebody I raised their hand and they asked, well, what about saying no UTF-8 to specify that my source code no longer is UTF-8 at this point, or using lexical scoping to say this block or this function is UTF-8. 
And I said, I don't know if you can do that or not. I haven't had the need of, for that, but please do not do that. Uh, he came to me after the talk and told me that he is, do, in fact, doing that uh, and, and why, but I'd recommend staying away from anything where you have different encodings in the same file. So yeah, after you specify UTF, use UTF-8, you just you know, you use UTF-8 as you want throughout the source code. Uh, additionally, it's good to know that in Perl, uh, where they use pod for documentation, plain old documentation, at the beginning of your pod, specify the encoding is UTF-8, so all of your documentation readers and converters uh, can consistently use your UTF-8 docs. Uh, then on, in Python, there's actually this comment that you can use at the top of your code that specifies, I've got UTF-8 source code. Yeah, it's a little ugly. I think that's from Emacs there. I, okay, you're, you're getting down on this, Duke, but I, I actually think Python 3 does it the right way. It's UTF-8 by default. So that's the way to go. And I, on, on Ruby, you can use that same ugly Python syntax but please use this instead. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot cleaner than that. What's that? Yeah. Oh. Well, there's the Python one. There's the the Ruby one. But you can use the Python one in Ruby if you really like that better. Glad to hear it. The, so he said that in uh, Ruby two, UTF eight is the default. So we can copy that uh, Python slide over here too. Perl 6 is, but we don't, we don't have a release of Perl 6, so I'm not going to bring that up. Yeah, so I, I know less on the Java side, although I believe it's UTF-16. I think you're so here's an example of a regular expression that you can write if you have UTF-8 source code. Um, this is a, I, this is Cyrillic characters. I actually, this is for Bulgarian, but Bulgarian uses Cyrillic characters. This is actually code that I, I wrote for a CPAN module uh, for a Bulgarian language stemmer. And let's, let's talk about this regular expression for a second here. Regular expressions, that's a language of its own. No matter what language you're using it in, it's its own language, and I recommend treating it like a language. Uh, in order to uh, truly treat it like the language it is, use the X modifier. I, almost any programming language, except uh, JavaScript comes to mind as one that doesn't support it, but most uh, modern programming languages have the X mode, which means that your white space is ignored and you can use comments. Uh, and then you can lay out your long, unruly, regular expressions that nobody else can read and turn it into something that, well, people do have a chance of reading. <laughs> so here we've just got some comments after our literal uh, Cyrillic characters. And I recommend using literal UTF-8 characters whenever it's an option, as opposed to escape sequences. If I had escape sequences throughout here, then I wouldn't know what any of those are. I would have to use conversion to uh, actually print them out or go look at uh, code charts. And just using UTF-8 throughout your source code will make life easier as long as your language supports it. And specifying UTF-8 is generally the way to do it in whatever language. Now, uh, in addition to that, I recommend using literal UTF-8 characters in your HTML and XML and anywhere else that you can do that. I see a lot of people think they need to escape them with uh, the various types of escape sequences that are available in HTML, whether it's um, I, entities and, and numeric uh, character references. So by default, I would just use literal UTF-8 characters and make sure that in the headers and such you, you're stating that uh, your response is UTF-8 so that people will actually know what encoding it is and their browsers will display the, the correct characters. If you do want to use um, numeric character references or the named HTML entities, I recommend the numeric character references because the named versions aren't actually part of the Unicode specification. It's a fairly limited subset of characters out there. I, and it's not part of the Unicode standard. And for the numeric character references, I prefer the, the hex version because with Unicode code points, each character uh, that we think of as a character here is a code point, uh, there's a, uh, you refer to them with a hex value. Uh, and then you can look them up uh, with the Unicode specification more easily than if it's a decimal value. But anyway, uh, I just use literal UTF-8 characters. 
And I mean, here's an example of where we're using Arabic script. This is actually for Persian, uh, Farsi, for a language stemmer that I, I also recently released to CPAM. And one interesting thing that happened is I needed to use a character class where you have individual characters within your square brackets uh, in order to match any one of those. Well, uh, the Arabic script automatically ligates characters where it sort of uh, combines characters in the visual representation and changes them drastically. I, that didn't work out very well in the display of my character class because I wanted to look at individual characters. So in scripts that automatically ligate the characters like Arabic, I recommend using a alternation like this if you're doing individual characters instead of a character class. But either way, your, your regex engine will understand because it's just a display issue. Now, there are some characters where there is, uh, where you really would want to escape them. That is control characters and uh, non-printing characters, as well as combining characters. Uh, these are characters that don't have a representation on their own, but when they come after a regular character, a base character, it forms a new glyph altogether. One example is the Arabic Kasra, which does not have a form on its own. It's intended to come after another character. So uh, this escape, sequences, uh, escape sequence may be new to some people, backslash uppercase N. It is not something that is supported universally in modern programming languages yet. It will be someday. It's a requirement of the Unicode specification for level one Unicode support to actually uh, support this in your language. With Perl, it's been available as of Perl, I think, 5.8 if you use the care names pragma, pragma, but in Perl 5.18, it's on by default, where you can use it in your uh, strings and regexes. I know that Python 2 supports it. Many languages do not yet support it, like Ruby doesn't support it. But I imagine that modern programming languages will all eventually support it someday. I, but I like it because, well, I can't use the literal character. At least here, I know exactly what it is by reading it. It's self-documenting code. So let's go over some uh, regular expression. I wait, does anyone know what this uh, backslash D matches? Exactly. So you've got uh, your ones, twos, and threes, and your digits, like your you know, Devanagari digits, and your Lao digits. Uh, this surprises some people, and that's because uh, we're increasingly seeing regex engines having Unicode semantics. And the Unicode uh, specification says, well, we need to support all digits as our digit matching uh, regex matcher. So, in Perl, for example, when you're matching against a Unicode string, any of these will work. And that's not commonly what you want if, you, if you're parsing it out and then doing math with it, for example. <laughs> um, so by default, uh, you can't use, I don't know any language where their uh, numeric operators will work with anything but the first, you know, our Western Arabic one, twos, and threes. But in, so many languages also, including Perl, there are options, whether it's an external library in most cases, to convert these other forms to a form that you can use. Um, so for example, there's the Unicode UCD module in Perl that has the num function and you can convert any of these to the digits that we'd expect to work with. What I recommend is when you want zero through nine, I ASCII digits explicitly use that because then, say you're doing validation, well, this is the validation you really want to be performing. But that would, you're, you're talking about specifically when you would, would need to interpret the digits as parts of a number, right, as opposed to simply text that happens to be digits. Right, right. I, when you want to I, interpret it as a number, say that you're going to do math with, or if just the requirements are to validate zero through nine in ASCII, this is what you want. And in most cases, I, I find that that is. If you were parsing, for example, street addresses, it, 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 might, it, it would 
strikes me as perfectly, it makes perfect sense. That Very much, and that's why that uh, backslash d, uh, d matches any digits from any script. Uh, it can be very useful in many situations, like uh, natural language processing, or just working with all sorts of data from around the world. Right. Now, backslash w, that is, matches word characters. Uh, and that's our a, b's, and c's, one, twos, and threes, and underscore. Um, but uh, alpha, beta, gamma, bopo, mofo, and uh, Arabic characters there, we've got some right to left action. Um, so another thing, that's another thing to keep in mind. And one thing that I wanted to point out about backslash w is that, in general, whether it's Unicode semantics or ASCII semantics, I don't find it very useful. There aren't many times when I want to match I, my numbers, letters, and underscore, whether it's just ASCII or if it's all of the scripts of the world. I hardly ever use this unless it's just like one-liners where I know that within the data I'm working with, this will do what I want it to do. I don't use it in my code and my modules. What's that? Chemical names. Okay, chemical names. And remember that the backslash b uh, word boundary matcher will have the same semantics. I, for whatever regular expression engine you're using, since I can't cover all of them, I, I recommend looking up and seeing if it uses ASCII semantics or Unicode semantics. And in some languages, you can flip it back and forth uh, and choose some sort of option for what you'd like. So backslash b, I, I was just pointing out that, well, it, since it matches a word boundary for a word, as in, you know, whatever backslash w is, it uses the same Unicode semantics when, when you've got a regex engine using Unicode semantics. Right, so you say you don't use backslash w, but do you use backslash b? No. And if you don't, would you have an alternative for it that's not this long? Yeah, I, yes, I do have alternatives, but it's much longer. I, using, I, you know... Yeah, look behinds, and so, so anyway, maybe uh, you have already validated your data, and you know what you're working with specifically, and you know that the subset of it is fine for using with backslash w or backslash b. Well, that's a completely valid use. Just know what it matches and what your data is. Yes, there's one way to do it explicitly with ASCII. I don't see why you'd do it. I don't know, hey, but I just wanted to give you the option here. It won't do underscore. I, I, we'll get to those. And then there's backslash S. I, this matches white space. So traditionally, it's matching the spaces and tabs and new lines and stuff. But behold, all of the Unicode white space uh, characters that it now matches. This is one where it's, yeah, that is the full <laughs> list. This is one where it, in, in almost any application, it's fine to upgrade to Unicode semantics with, and it doesn't really matter if the programmer knows, it, because in general, more white space isn't going to break things. I should note that in Perl 5.18 that was just released about a month ago, uh, they added the vertical tab to this, even in the ASCII uh, semantics, but I've never seen a vertical tab personally, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, backslash uppercase R, this is one that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but is very useful. It's not in all regex engines. Uh, it is in uh, trickling into various Perl compatible ones. It's in the PCRE library. I'm not sure about all languages, but it means I uh, match a line ending, any line ending. So backslash N, for example, I w is very limited in what it will match, whereas backslash uppercase R will match any type of line ending. We've got our uh, line feed, uh, carriage return, form feed, uh, even CRLF. This is two code points. It will match those two code points as one match. 
Also, a next line vertical tab, a line separator, paragraph separator. A lot of these are Unicode forms of line endings. But this is a powerful regex tool here. And then there's the dot. I, this is sort of a, this slide's a, an experiment in minimalism. It's a 200 point uh, a dot here. What, does anyone know what uh, this matches? So, I asked this, I asked this at Yapsi a week ago. And I, I had some similar responses, any character or any character except New Line. And then the third response came from Larry Wall, the creator of Pearl, and he said, "It depends." <laughs> yeah, he right. So that that was the most correct response that I received. I yes, and it, if it wasn't correct, he could go and change it. So anyway, what is important to remember here? is that when we say it matches any character except Newline, it's, we're specifically saying it matches any code point except a Newline. And in most cases, a code point is what we think of as a character. But there are also things called um, grapheme clusters, and those are series of code points that uh, make up what is one user-perceived character. And there is the backslash uppercase X to match grapheme clusters. This will match one or more code points that makes up a grapheme cluster, one user perceived character. So let's take a look here. I, I don't know if anyone's used this character before. Uh, does anyone have any idea where you would use it? <laughs> so, yeah, Vicky wins on this one. I, that's the one place I know about, Spinal Tap. Unfortunately, the Unicode Consortium didn't take Spinal Tap into consideration when defining what characters exist. So in order to represent this, you have to have a lowercase n followed by a combining diaresis. You can make all sorts of new characters with the combining characters, and this is two code points, I, but one grapheme cluster. And to the end user, this is a character. So when you're representing uh, how many characters there are to a user, it's good to think about this. Most places do not. I mean, Twitter, they consider characters to be code points in their 140 characters. Uh, other examples here are CRLF. Yes, it's two code points, but really these are two control code points that make one logical control character. I, additionally, you see this a lot in Korean, because in Korean, you have um, Hangul that is made up of a series of Jamo code points, and then it, each unit is a grapheme cluster. Yes? Can I get, get like a, a, an official definition of code point? Well, I, so in, say, ASCII, I, many people are familiar with the uh, characters of ASCII. <laughs> And although those are, that's a subset of Unicode, I, and those are each code points, um, it's expanded to massive levels in Unicode where they each are code points and they are oftentimes referred to as characters, but they can do things, as shown here, that do control purposes or combine to make new ones. It's sort of... Well, well I guess I'm just looking for a short definition. And I think what you're saying is, is a code point is something that has a listing in the Unicode specification. Yes, it has a listing in the Unicode, a code point has a listing in the Unicode specification. It has, every code point has a name, and every code point has a number that is referred to in hexadecimal form. Okay. So that would include like multi-byte characters. That includes multi-byte characters, yes, because they aren't multi-byte in Unicode inherently, they're multi-byte in one of the Unicode encoded forms, like UTF-8, UTF-16, or UTF-32. How do implementations of length deal with the, the graphing clusters versus characters? In general, you will have... Uh, so, 
implementations of length, dealing with graphing clusters versus code points, most, I, I don't know of any programming language that works with its core functions or methods on the graphing cluster le level. I, normally, if it's got Unicode support, it's on the code point level, and there's some sort of additional library that will work on the graphing cluster level. I, I've got some of these examples in the repo that I'll, a GitHub repo that I'll show at the end, but in Perl, Ruby, Python, PHP, there are all ways to work on the graphing cluster level. So let's talk about some of the uh, Unicode property matchers that Duke brought up. I, backslash P, I, followed by various different things. Let's take a look here. ASCII. Well, if we wanted to match any ASCII code point, this is the simplest, most readable way to do it. What this is saying is we want to match the property named ASCII for anywhere where that property value is true. And you can negate it by doing an uppercase P. This will match any code point that is not in ASCII. I find these two very useful for like command line, you know, one-liners and such, especially when I'm parsing through my data trying to see what I have. Then, in general, with the uh, character property matchers, what you have is first the property name. This is general category and then equals property value. Here, in this case, it's letter. General category is one of the most useful properties, and it's because it uh, takes, let's see, it takes various uh, properties of characters like letters, numbers, and so forth, and lets you match against them. There are a lot of shortcuts, though, because I don't want to see this throughout my regular expressions. It's going to multiply I, my regex is by so much. So it, general category is so common that you can leave it off entirely and just do the value for it. And in fact, it's so common that there are one letter versions for any of the values of uh, the general category property. If it's one letter, you can even leave off the braces. I, I know that you know, Perl, PCRE, many regex engines are supporting this. Here is all of the general categories. We've got letter, mark, number, punctuation, symbol, separator, and other. Each category has subcategories that are expressed in two letters. I'm not going to go through them all, but here are examples for the symbol category. The subcategories are math symbol, currency symbol, modifier symbol, and other symbol. This is very useful. What if you want to match any currency symbol? Well, you can do you know, backslash P and in curly braces, I, S, C. These are case insensitive, but the standard way is to use the case forms described here. Another very popular uh, ca uh, property is the script property. And this is referring to scripts of the written languages of the world. So here we're matching any code point that has the Latin value for the script property. And it is so commonly used that hopefully more common after this, uh, that you can actually just use the value. Fortunately, the script values, the general category values, and all of the property names don't conflict with each other, so that's why you can get away with doing these shortcuts with these two popular properties. With all of the other properties, you will actually have to state property equals and then the value. I, and I can't nearly dive into all of the Unicode character properties, but uh, they're all out there on the internet to go and explore and improve your regex parsing. So here's an example of using the script property in a character class to match all of the scripts of the Japanese writing system. Hiragana, katakana, I, han, which is uh, used here for kanji, Latin, and common isn't one of the writing systems. Instead, this is common is its own character property for uh, the common letters that are shared among many of the scripts. So punctuation, white spaces, and such, that will all be matched by common. And there are even short four-letter uh, forms for any of the script names. 
And these are all defined in the Unicode specification. Here are some more examples. There are lots of different scripts you can work with. I don't know if anyone here has worked with G uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, but this is what you need to match against them. So here, actually, here's some Perl code uh, from the Bulgarian stemmer. And if anyone was curious, I, I've mentioned stemming a few times, and that's not part of this talk, but if, if anyone's curious what a stemmer is, I, since I mentioned it, it is a function where you pass a word and it returns the stem of that word. So anyway, here we are using Cyrillic matcher to match a Cyrillic code point. A, among various literal Cyrillic characters. Now, let's get into letter casing. This is all in pseudocode, I, but I, I thought this would work better than any of the individual programming languages in demonstrating this. Let's take this uh, German word here that contains a German sharp S and lowercase it, well, I, there our first form is equivalent to the second form, I, which is just the literal lowercase version. Now let's uppercase it. Well, some folks might be a little surprised with what we get there. I, German sharp S uppercases to uppercase S, uppercase S. And that's because there isn't a capitalized German sharp S. But this brings some problems what if you're going to compare the lowercase version to the uppercase and then lowercase version? It's not round trip. You are going to have a lowercase s, lowercase s. This is why you need case folding. Case folding is a form of a completely case insensitive, it's a completely case insensitive form for comparison and collation. So if you case fold, I, then you can compare both of them on the same grounds because in the end you're going to get lowercase s, lowercase s. It is, case folding is not intended for display purposes. It's intended for comparison purposes. And many programming languages are starting to add it in. I, for example, Perl added it in as a core component in I, I think 5.16 and Python has it in Python 2. I, so other languages have libraries for it. Ruby has a Ruby gem in order to do it. Now let's talk a little about uh, normalization. So I mentioned before that there are combining characters. Well, what if you wanted to compare your code point that is uh, O with diaresis to O followed by combining diaresis. And uh, just to point out here, commonly when you want to display combining characters, uh, you use a dotted circle with the diacritic, that is, you know, squiggly parts that we put around uh, other characters. So format that around the uh, dotted circle for presentation purposes. So anyway, the Unicode standard says that this should be considered canonically equivalent. For all intents and purposes, it should be equivalent. And in order to compare it on the same level, you need to normalize. There are multiple different normalization forms that we can't get into depth with that, but one of these is a normalization form I composed. And we're going to use that for these examples because it will any of them will work out for our purposes here. So we're normalizing both of these, and now they do compare equivalently. And if you want to do the case folding and normalization, well, you know, there are very much cases for that. So I showed the flow of working with UTF-8 encoded content and actual character strings before. I, let's take a look at that with normalization because it can be very beneficial to normalize on input and optionally normalize on output just to make sure you're consistently working with the same normalization form throughout your application and you don't have to deal with normalizing for comparison purposes. So if you want to do that, uh, you would take your UTF-8 encoded input, decode it, and then you put character strings. I, then you use one of the normalization forms, 
There are good reasons for using different ones. Here in this example, we're using normalization form decomposed, where that turns it into as many code points as possible, uh, generally. Then, you know, hack on your code. Some people like to normalize on output because you, once you're munging your data, you could have denormalized data and say you want to put it in a database in normalized form. Encode, and you've got your normalized UTF-8 encoded data. So at Shutterstock, I, we release two to four languages every quarter for our web applications. And in the end of last year, we released Hungarian, Czech, Polish, and Turkish. Although when we initially released, there was a bug in our language dropdown. Can anyone spot it? So the problem here is that we are uh, sorting on the numeric code point value. So we have check down here. Even though the base character here is a C, which means it really, it should be above Danish uh, and not below everything else in the Latin script here. You've got a question? So I, a good point was brought up that different languages do sorting differently. I, but both in Czech and in the Unicode collation algorithm, we should have this coming at the top of this list. I, so well, we fixed that I, pretty quickly. And how we did that was using I, the Unicode collation algorithm. Many languages, most languages that I was looking at, have some sort of library in order to do this. I, and here's some pseudocode here where we're instantiating a Unicode collator and then using the sort method to sort our countries and return a sorted list using the Unicode collation algorithm. If you have mixed data I, with various different languages, like in the example we showed, the default UCA is a good way to go because it generally does the right thing for sorting ver strings from various different languages, you know, names of people in all different languages. However, if you are sorting just one language, oftentimes there's different rules in each language for collation. So uh, a good Unicode collator will provide the option to specify the locale. Here we're doing the German locale and we're doing our German specific sort. If you're supplying data that's all in one language to a user, localized collation is the way to go. And I, for good Unicode collators, uh, ones that follow the specification, there are various levels of collation. And just for example here, level two will ignore case entirely. So with this collator, we have an equality method, and it's another way that somebody could do uh, string equality, both case insensitive and normalization, since the collator is performing its own normalization, since that's part of the Unicode collation algorithm. So it's not just important to write code that is Unicode aware. Whether you support Unicode or not, you're going to be getting Unicode data, but it's not just important to write code that's Unicode aware, it's also important to test it. So one thing I recommend testing, first off, is characters with code points above 7F. Uh, and here is a, a little problem we had uh, with the conference registration. This is so good. I was wondering what that was about. Yes. Like yeah, this was not a joke. This is mojibaki. Mojibaki is the Japanese word for character corruption. And it's a much more elegant way of saying it. So anyway, I have never seen this form of mojibaki before, but it's quite interesting. I, I saw someone tweet, I think, uh, is the greater than or equal sign silent? <laughs> so I, I'm sure she'll appreciate that her name's a good one to use in your testing. Also, testing ab above uh, FF code points. 
I, or literally in, in the Unicode standard, we always pad it to uh, four characters, so it's more zero zero FF. But anyway, above FF, above the Latin range, uh, that's important as well. Here we've got um, Matt's name. And what's very important is testing above FFFF. Because this is when you get in, if you're using UTF-16 data, this is when you get into surrogate pairs. That's just with UTF-16. But uh, it's oftentimes there will be libraries or languages entirely like JavaScript and Java that use UTF-16 internally. And that's why it's good to do some testing with these much higher range of characters. Yeah, so UCS2 was an earlier version, a pre-UTF-16 that did not support this upper range. So anyway, there we've got the emoji character for a winking cat with its tongue sticking out. I made sure to fit some cats into this slide for you to go with the general theme here. Also graphene clusters, of course. I uh, testing just graphene clusters in general, but also your equivalents. If you are looking up names of things, uh, making sure that those match regardless of what your uh, normalization form is. And of course, as I mentioned, digits in various different scripts. Here's an example of some Shutterstock production code for our Czech uh, stemmer. And this, we released it to CPAN, so it's all available open source there. I, but this is a Perl test file I, where we specify, use UTF-8, okay, our contents in UTF-8, then we use the open pragma, specifying our encoding is UTF-8, so this says all of our file handles, no matter what, by default, it is UTF-8 input, UTF-8 output, and it does implicit decoding from UTF-8 to character strings and encoding from character strings to UTF-8 just on the I.O. La layer. So that's a very way, to, a good way to go around uh, because then you're just working with character strings throughout your script or application. And standard specifies also your standard, um, like standard in, standard out, standard error. Make sure to think about standard error and logging because you generally want to be using UTF-8 for your standard error and logging as well. I, then we're defining, we've got 66 tests in here. I only show you a few and that's the module we're testing out. And of course, I'm just using the literal UTF-8 characters. I, that's lingua stem unine, U-N-I-N-E on CPAN. So uh, that's what I've got for you today. I, well, and, and this, that's the one other thing I've got for you. This was taken this morning from my mother, so I managed to fit some more cats, this one typing. Um, anyway, any questions? Um, I have a question, did I not see the solution for um, with Unicode and Unicode where like in German, the A umlaut or the A that I resist is also AE? Yes, so the question is about, um, a with an umlaut. We can call it an umlaut instead of a diarsis here because we're talking about German. And so A with an umlaut is being equivalent to AE. Well, in many systems, for transliterating the umlaut, you will re remove it entirely and add an E after. Say if you can only work with ASCII. Also, uh, many people who have anglicized their name will do that as well, I would say, when, when immigrating. And in some cases, you might want to compare where uh, A with an umlaut is equivalent to AE. But in many cases, you don't, because that's a German-specific feature. There are many languages that include a diarsis, and most of them do not have that functionality where there's an E after. So I, oftentimes, there some languages will have libraries for that, you know, external libraries for it. Other times you might have to do the work yourself. Do you have a strategy for dealing with data files where you can't make, where you can't assume that, that there's, uh, it, it follows the rules of the encoding it supposedly follows? Like, like uh, just yesterday I was parsing some files that were in theory UTF-8, but in fact someone had edited it with, I think probably with a Mac. Uh, right. Well, fortunately, I, with UTF-8, 
Say you've got some corrupted data or bad data or just like incorrect characters in there. I, that will never affect the valid UTF-8 characters later on in the file because you can, depending on the byte you're at, you can always tell the boundaries of your UTF-8 character. So I, the proper thing to do is I generally to either fail on incorrect data, or if you don't want to do that, replace just your invalid data with the, there's a special code point uh, for the purpose of doing that, and you would just replace it with that, and oftentimes that's displayed as a triangle with a little box around it. I mean, no, sorry, a question mark with a little box around it. So there, there are different ways to go about it. Yeah, and, and by default, choking is a good way to go because it's invalid data, but then if you don't want to choke, sometimes there are ways to, uh, depending on your language and your library, there are ways to specify doing something else like doing replacement characters. Okay, well, I think I, we're, we're out of time here, but I'm happy to talk to anyone else here. I'll be uh, around for the rest of the conference. <laughs> and I'll post all my slides to Twitter as well as on our notes page on the Open Source Bridge site. Thank you. So much. Thank you.